The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, A Vision in White, the origins of a legend come to life. The past becomes a playground for the future, and we learn to reduce, reuse, recycle, and reach for the stars. All that, plus the Build-A-Bear Workshop meets Jurassic Park, and we continue our ongoing serialization of David Weber's Uncompromising Honor, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I'm Bain Consulting Editor David Afsharirad. Today we bring you my conversation with Dan Cobalt about his new novel, Domesticating Dragons. It's a near future techno thriller that combines cutting edge genetic engineering speculation with a plot full of twists, turns, and action, and a little romance thrown in for good measure. Oh, and did I mention there are dragons? Because there are dragons. Dan's a new author here at Bain, and it was great to have a chance to sit down and chat with him. And now, the news. Head on over to Bain.com, where this month we have two short stories and one nonfiction essay, all for free. First up is Latuda's Lady in White by Aaron Michael Ritchie. This is a Hiram Woolley short story set in the world of The Cunning Man and the upcoming The Jupiter Knife, novels which Ritchie co-wrote with DJ Butler. Hiram Woolley is a cunning man, a wielder of powerful magic he endeavors to help those beset by supernatural forces. His adopted son, Michael, is a man of science, a boy not yet sure he believes the fairy stories his father tells. When Hiram has a recurring dream of a ghostly woman in white in the small mining town of Latuda, the pair are called to the service of a grieving father, and what they find beneath the soil will prove a challenge to both father and son. Next up, we have a story of the founder effect. Listeners to the podcast may remember my two-part interview with the editors of, and some of the contributors to, that all-new anthology. Appleseed is a short story set in the world of the founder effect by anthology co-editor Robert E. Hampson. On the colony world of Cistercia, the men and women who first settled that alien planet have over time become legends in their own right imprinting the colony and its culture with their own unique personalities. Call it the founder effect. But these legends were once flesh and blood. This is one of their stories. And in this month's nonfiction essay, Jim Beale takes a look at how the natural world and human history may help us get to the stars by recycling. After all, stars recycle all the time, and so must we if we are to reach them. Read Recycling from Stars to Starships by Jim Beal for more details. And while you're over at Bain.com, check out Bain eBooks, where Steve White's new eBook exclusive novel, Malice of Fortune, is available now, DRM free, of course. What if the past is merely a playground for the future? In a new, evolving timeline, Cesare Borgia did not follow a path that led to a fatal ambush and unfulfilled ambitions but instead attempts to create a powerful Renaissance empire centuries in advance of the modern nation. But someone, or something, with shadowy motives and nefarious purposes may be aiding Borgia every step of the way. And when a beautiful operative from a future that may never be shows up to set things right, the stakes become human freedom itself in a transformed future. And that's it for the news. And now my conversation with Dan Cobalt about his new novel, Domesticating Dragons. Hi everybody, I'm here with Dan Cobalt to talk about his new novel, Domesticating Dragons. He's the author of the Gateways to Alyssa trilogy, the editor of Putting the Science in Science Fiction from Writer's Digest, and the creator of the sci-fi adventure serial, The Triangle. As a genetics researcher, he has co-authored more than 80 publications in Nature, Science, the New England Journal of Medicine, and other scientific journals. He is also an avid deer hunter and outdoorsman. He lives in 
Ohio with his wife and children, where the deer take their revenge by eating flowers in his backyard. Dan, thanks so much for coming to the Bane for You Radio Hour and uh, talking about the book today. Oh, thanks for having me on and true story about the deer. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I just wanted to say um, I love this book. I had so much fun reading it. I read it in like two sittings, basically. Um, but I think we should address it's called Domesticating Dragons, which might make people think fantasy novel, but it is not a fantasy novel. It's a sort of a near, very near future, I would say. Uh, techno thriller. So tell us uh, about the dragons in Domesticating Dragons, what they are, where they came from. You're right. It's not really a fantasy novel. It also, sadly, is not an instruction manual either, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's another misconception. So you're right. I consider this near future science fiction, and it draws a lot on my experience as a genetics researcher. But the basic idea is that uh, a genetic engineer goes to work for a company that has developed dragons, which they customized for sale on the retail market. <clears throat> and so he, um, you know, goes there for a number of reasons. Obviously, the place is uh, making and selling dragons. Who wouldn't want to work there, right? But he's also keen to get into the company because they have some unique equipment and resources that he'd like to use for his own reasons, because his brother was born with a genetic disorder that so far has proved incurable. And so he's wondering if he can leverage some of those corporate resources to help find an answer for his brother. Yeah, so these dragons are uh, basically synthetic, I guess you would say, life forms that they create. Yes. But they're created for, I thought, a, a, a purpose that uh, you said you're an outdoorsman resonates probably with you and also <laughs> anyone who's, uh, you know, I'm in Texas, uh, we're familiar with this. Uh, yes. So talk about where in this in the world of this book uh, the you know um, the creators within the book came up with the idea for dragons and for what purpose they were initially uh, made right so if you're if you're in Texas you're familiar with the problem of uh, feral hogs or mm -hmm. wild hogs that basically they were once domestic hogs that escaped into the wild and now they're a, a rampant problem in a lot of parts of the United States especially the South and the American Southwest. And so <clears throat> the, the origins of the company that makes these dragons uh, are related to their founder who proposed that they develop a synthetic creature to tackle the hog problem because wild hogs, they're very difficult to, to control. Like this is real world stuff. Their populations are, have been growing and they compete with natural species for food and it's very hard to keep their populations in check. And like a pack of wild hogs can clear tens of acres of crops or natural vegetation overnight. And so in the book, the founder of the company proposes that they would create this synthetic creature with reptilian origins that would be designed and purpose bred to hunt and uh, eliminate wild hogs from some of these inflicted areas. So that was the origins of the company. Um, it was a success. I don't think that's a spoiler for the book. I mean, their, their efforts in that regard succeeded. And then they thought, well, maybe we should begin finding other purposes for these uh, dragons that we can create. And they begin eyeing the consumer market because the other background event that we haven't touched on yet is mm -hmm. that the world has no dogs, really, virtually no dogs left in it because they've been wiped out by a canine epidemic, a com communicable epidemic that has removed most dogs from the population and as yet has not been cured either. So there are lots of roles that dogs fill in our society. And when you think about all the things that they do for us, like everything from household pet to seeing eye dog, to hunting companion, to security animal, um, this company thinks, well, maybe we can fill those roles with custom dragons. And so that's sort of where the book begins. Yeah. And we follow, um, Noah Parker, who's the narrator and the main character in the story. And uh, he, I, you said this a little bit in the introduction, he is uh, sort of as a single purpose, a very single-minded purpose in his life uh, that he goes into this genetic engineering field. And he specifically wants to work for, uh, they call it Reptilian Corp at first, and then it becomes Build a Dragon. Um, and he's our narrator. And he, he is part of the novel, I would say maybe the, you know, the first section of it 
is really about him and the team there, uh, well, him getting on, but then the team there going about domesticating dragons because initially they're bred to be super predators in a way. Um, yes. And then you want to have one to replace your dog unless your dog is, you know, an attack dog or something, even mm -hmm. if it is, it's not really, the, the original design is not compatible with that. And so it's about them, as the title would suggest, domesticating them. And I, I was interested in that. And I thought it was interesting how you explore without spoiling too much. Um, there's different ways to go about domesticating animals and sort of the avenues that they pursue in that. And I thought maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Right. Um, <clears throat> and this, this does draw a little bit on my background in genetics because for a while I worked at one of the large scale genome sequencing centers that sequenced the human gene, part of the human genome and also other species that have had their genome sequenced. And one scientific question that has interested a lot of people is, is domestication of animals, including livestock and just household pets like cats and dogs. And the history in that is very interesting. I mean, I think probably many people are familiar with domestication of dogs, right? I mean, it, it yeah. doesn't take a science degree to figure out that dogs were domesticated from the ancestors of wolves mm -hmm. uh, that were essentially captured as pets and bred for um, tameness and docility and loyalty and the, the traits that we value in dogs. But many of the breeds that we recognize now were created through generations and generations of selective inbreeding of, of dogs that had certain traits that were valuable. A lot of these uh, were bred in England for specific purposes like pest control and hunting dogs and retrievers for retrieving like uh, game. And yes. so that uh, the science of domestication and the history of it has always fascinated me. And so I was thinking about what would you do to fast track the domestication of a completely wild animal because completely wild animals really um, what we think of as domestication isn't something you can necessarily do in that animal even if you capture it as a pup like for example if you capture a fox as a pup that's a wild animal it will never be as tame as a dog it may become accustomed to humans but it won't be truly domesticated and so they're exploring some of the genetics that underlie uh, the evolution of domesticated animals and how, and they're looking and thinking about how things like dogs and cats became domesticated. The cat domestication story is really fascinating because unlike dogs, cats sort of domesticated themselves. I mean, they first arose in uh, parts of ancient Egypt where uh, they had just begun to start farming and producing enough produce that they could store it and survive on it for longer periods. And obviously the storage of grain attracted rats and rodents. And so cats, what the ancestors of cats saw this as an opportunity to move into a place where there were lots of prey available for them and maybe be afforded some protection. So cats in that sense sort of domesticated themselves. And I think anyone who uh, owns cats can probably recognize that they have a little more independence than dogs do. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about the different paths, and then we the dragons in the book are sort of um, a, a mixture of a lot of different creatures, I guess, but mostly with a reptilian base to them. Um, and so, uh, I just wondered how you know more about this than I do, like by a factor of some odd. What is the process in the story? If we could talk about that, of how they go about you know, um, mixing together all these animals to create a dragon, you know, maybe there's a little bit of speculation or hand waving, but uh, definitely right. <laughs> this is, I mean, this, otherwise it would be an instruction manual, right? No, it, it would. I mean, so the, the branch that we're talking about now is synthetic biology and that is a real science that is practiced. Um, it's still, I would say in its infancy. And so it's possible, of course, to we, we now have the capabilities to sequence genomes. We have the capabilities to uh, synthesize specific sequences of DNA, long sequences. And so there are researchers exploring whether or not you can use that to create a new organism where you design it from the genome up. And there have been some early successes in that, but most of those early stages, it's like very simple single cell organisms as you might expect as the creature gets more complicated, so does the genome. And so 
that's the part where you know we give it a little bit of the stretch because right now we're at the point of maybe creating uh, synthetic single cell organisms and you're talking about creating a living breathing creature that's very complex that's a long that's a little bit farther in the future than i think most of us would like to believe but the idea was uh, in the book that they want to create this predator to solve this very specific problem and and so they want to find organisms that have traits that they want to put into whatever this creature is that they create and so they start raising funds and they want to go out and sequence um, organisms that would be viable like the komodo dragon obviously and um reptilian predators and and other species but um fundraising has to do with marketing as you probably know and so if you said we're we're doing a fundraising project to create a synthetic organism for the control of wild hogs right. that's not a very exciting prospect from a fundraising point of view so of course the clever people doing this called it the dragon reference project said we're going to create a genome for a dragon and that got people excited and brought in the funding that they sort of needed to get this off the ground yeah so a lot of this is well maybe not a lot early on a lot of this is noah parker and the team sort of sitting down in front of a computer and writing code essentially and i remember years ago watching i don't know why i watched this but i watched the director's commentary of david kep on the johnny depp movie secret window and he's a writer in that i'm going somewhere with this and he says if okay. you watch the movie he's a writer and it's all about stories and da, da, da. but there's about 20 seconds of him writing because writing is boring you just sit in a room and write you know it's boring to watch but i thought Coding is probably boring to watch, but somehow you made it interesting in the book. You know, I was drawn along with him sitting there typing lines and lines of code. Um, and I think one way you did that was with this points limitation that they have that's part of Build a Dragon, uh, how they go about that. So I was wondering, because then it's almost like we're watching him, it's a game that he's playing in a way yeah. against himself or against the, the <clears throat> right. So yes. tell us about the points limitation, what it does in the book, and then also kind of what it did for you as a writer to write within that framework. Right now, you're right that the, I didn't want to have a guy sitting in front of a computer with no other stuff happening for the book. I mean, that probably would be too exciting. So one of the challenges he's up against in trying to do, he's basically, once they, once they develop a domesticated dragon, the next natural step is to come up with certain breeds or which they call models that would have useful purposes and could be sold. And so one thing he's often up against um, is that they work under this point system where they, the amount of uh, advantages you give to any particular dragon model is somewhat limited by how many points you're allotted to do this. And the point, the, the essential reason for this is they don't want their designers to end up creating a super predator that suddenly turns on its owners. Nobody wants that, right? We've all seen Jurassic Park. So <laughs> they, um, they're limited in that sense. And so if you give a dragon, you know, agility and size and intelligence, you have to take away other features to reach the balance required to get in under the point quota. And so that's just something that he's often struggling with because, you know, once the easy dragon designs are solved, now it's creating the challenging one. How do you create a dragon that is um, agile and capable of flying and smart enough to fly without um, running into so stationary objects? It's hard to do that. It's hard to give a creature advantages enough to do the things you want it to do without giving it what we would consider too many. So that's something he struggles with, especially early on in the project. And as a writer, I just wonder where that came from. Was that sort of, you know, again, I'm going to go to movies, Hitchcock kind of talking almost about the censors, but how that was in a way, then you had to be smarter to get around them. And I wonder as a writer, if for you, that was sort it was sort of, as it's maybe frustrating for him, but it's sort of fun for you to play with how do we do that? Um, was that something, or where did that idea come from, I guess? But I, or was it just sort of that utilitarian, you know, we've seen Jurassic Park, we don't want them to get up. Because it does play in later into the book. I don't want to talk too much about it. But No, I, I, I think you're, you're right that there's more to it than simply creating an obstacle for him. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that I write have a protagonist who's up against the system in some ways. And the system might be a company or an employer or 
society as a whole or governmental regulations. And so the, the points limitation is just another system that our protagonist is up against and trying to find ways to beat. Um, he doesn't really control the, the point system, but he's a programmer and developer and that gives him certain advantages, right? I mean, someone who develops software and codes for a living has certain advantages and deeper knowledge of things like software licenses and other things that you might think of as limitations. And so naturally he has some uh, inklings of ways to kind of stretch his, stretch his abilities and stretch the rules a little bit. He definitely is the type of person who wants to do that. Yeah. Well, and he's got a reason for it, which you mentioned earlier, which is his uh, brother. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit and how that is in a way a subplot and in a way drives the plot. Um, which is that his brother has this um, degenerative uh, muscle disease, I guess. Um, and just, I guess, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we should. <laughs> I mean, so when I was writing the book and <clears throat> working on it, and we were talking about the protagonist and why he does what he decides to do, somebody pointed out that, hey, somebody with his abilities could probably get a job at many places. Why would he go work for the dragon company? I said, well, they make dragons. I don't understand the fundamental. Why do I need to mode more? Why wouldn't anybody go work for the company that makes dragons? But it's true. I mean, anybody who has a ver very unique skill set and is employable could probably get a job anywhere. And so why do people choose to work the places they do? And I thought it would be um, interesting as a driver for him if he were not just interested in the dragons, but the underlying technology. And so that fit together nicely with some elements of the plot, right? Where he wants to work at this company and of course wants the company to succeed so he can continue to work there, but he also has his own internal motivations that he doesn't necessarily share with everyone, but it's been something that's driving him. And this is where my real world uh, work probably seeps into the story because what I do for a living is I study the genomes of kids who are sick, who have, genetic disorders, including epilepsy, pediatric cancer, and like rare inherited diseases, and trying to under, understand what the cause of those diseases might be. And so we use genome sequencing to tackle that question. And in many cases, I would say a third to a half of cases, we can often find an answer for a child who's very sick. Um, unfortunately, it often doesn't mean that we have a cure for them or something that might inform their therapy because somebody who's born with a genetic condition often that's in every cell in their body right and so it can be difficult to have that information and not be able to act on it and so it's something i spent a lot of time thinking about we're starting to reach a point where maybe that could be changing with uh the advent of things like gene therapy and there have been real successes with gene therapy for uh certain diseases in the past several years. And so that's something that got me excited and thinking about um, what would be our character's motivations for his brother. His brother has a genetic disease. He actually has a disease I know quite well because we um, are so among the groups who helped characterize this new disease gene. It's called BICD2. It's a, and mutations in this gene cause spinal muscular atrophy and it can range in severity from sort of a mild muscle weakness that develops later in life and makes you makes you makes it difficult for you to like go up and down stairs all the way to the severe end where a child is born with immediate features of this disease and usually has a very rough uh, and devastating clinical course and so thinking about those kinds of patients and trying to understand what causes their disease and its severity and what could we eventually do to help them is something that definitely seeped from my my uh, day job into this book a little bit. Yeah. Well, it definitely, I think, um, makes it for a more round character. Actually, there's a, an interview early on in the book uh, with the security guard that kind of tackles that, like, well, why, you know, why wouldn't you want to work here? It's making dragons. But I think it makes for a more compelling story if they're, you know, with this other aspect of his life. And I was going to say, oh, the other thing is, and this is kind of how he uses a camouflage, but it's also a little bit true, which is that you've also got this sort of, uh, I don't know, elderly Elon Musk type, I don't know what you would call him, Simon Redwood, who's the founder of the company, who has this sort of cult-like following. And he's the one who initially uh, 
came up with this concept of of synthetic dragons um and i just he was i liked him he kind of looms over this story he's this mysterious figure we don't quite see um i just wondered if you could talk about him a little bit oh well first let me say it's exciting to hear someone other than me talking about the characters <laughs> in my book i really enjoy that <laughs> So uh, you definitely have read it. So uh, I have read it. I'm very grateful for that. But it's true. I mean, um, I think people, uh, everyone has a hero and, and people that they admire and look up to. And in, in the book for Noah Parker, that's this guy, Simon Redwood, who was the inventor who sort of founded this. And he is kind of like an Elon Musk uh, type figure where he is an inventor who has tried lots of different things, very creative, innovative ideas. They don't always work. Um, but he's tried a lot of things. And one of his successes was this company that, um, that makes dragons. And so that it's, it's someone who our protagonist has sort of known about, looked up to for a long time. It's, it's another reason he's interested in going to work for the company. At least that's what he tells the chief of security, right? That, um, and of course that, that guy and his legacy are part of what looms over the book. I mean, this guy who created this uh, really interesting technology and, and made it possible and brought dragons into our world and, and his fingerprints are all over the things that happen in the story. And I just thought that was a, a fun aspect of it. He was always in the story from very early on, but I think um, especially working with my editor, Tony Daniel, I, I brought him a little bit more into the story than I had initially planned. And I'm really glad of that because um, he's an interesting guy, like you say. Yeah. Um, I was going to talk about the other oh uh the other thing i liked so then we also have this uh sport of geocaching that our sport like hobby i don't know what hobby, it is yeah activity um is that something that is that another part of your personal life that seeped in or are you or this is just uh how did that come about oh right that's sort of uh you know everybody needs a hobby and so that's our protagonist hobby he um is looking for something to do to like uh, take a mental break sometimes from the work that he does at this company. And so he takes up geocaching, which for anybody who doesn't know, it's essentially, it's like a scavenger hunt where you take your GPS unit, you go out and there are all these geocaches and they're all over the world. There's probably one within a mile of where anyone who's listening to this is sitting right now. And the point being that you get these clues and it tells you where to go and you work out the coordinates of where to go to find the next clue and eventually to find the so-called cache, which is usually just a little hidden item that you go out and seek. And so it's a, you know, it, it's a combination of like outdoorsmanship and also sort of a geeky technology angle to it too. I, I mean, I, I like it obviously. And, and so it's just something that our protagonist takes up and it gets him out into the desert because I really like the desert landscape and the fact that he's, in the American Southwest. And um, it was a good way to have him get out there and see some of that unique landscape because there are these odd parallels between what you think of as sort of the uh, Arizona backdrop and Arizona wild, rough, rugged country and areas where a creature like a dragon probably would thrive with uh, places with a lot of sunshine and heat and rocks. That, that would be a, probably a good place for a lizard-like creature. So it's something that gets him out there and. Um, has important roles to play in the book too and in, in how things sort of come about. So yes, I'm glad you asked about that. It's just something cool that's yeah. been part of the story from early on. Um, I also uh, really liked that there are, th there's certainly this, I think like a, a fast paced plot, it, it kept me reading, but there's also a little bit of room to breathe in it, which I think is a good thing. And that we see sort of these, not quite side, interludes quests, but inter well that we do see though that's what i was going to get to um yeah. which is that the we have these then we have these kind of just little interludes which are uh, a lot of them are like you put the dragon manual in there and the uh, some tr customer service <laughs> transcripts which were oh, really yeah. funny and fun to break things up and uh i wonder where that came from and i imagine those were a lot of fun to write oh they were i mean that <laughs> uh that's something a lot of people told me they really enjoy when, when I'm reading like reviews of the book. Mm -hmm. um, people often remark on those. It's just like, it's like a little, they're just spiced here and there throughout the story to kind of uh, break up the tension of the ongoing plot. But I did have fun writing those and I thought it would be, you know, for this project, I wanted to have something 
uh, unique and distinct about the format of it and to have these little interludes there where, um, you know, they go and explore this, what's going on in customer, customer support for a company that sells customized dragons. You can just start to imagine the kind of calls and requests that they're getting. And so I did have fun with that. And it's something that, uh, you know, balances out the ongoing uh, tension of the plot, like I said, and it's just fun for me because I, uh, I like to write stuff that people find funny, and it, this was like a good chance for me to do that. Yeah, and I also like this is not quite that, but how there are some requests that he just because he they were they do develop these prototypes for different, um, well, for household pets, for couriers, for this, but in between that, they're making money by selling customized drag and you have standard models and custom models and i love just right. how he was you know just doing this with some of these goofy custom models there's <laughs> one that's i don't know i guess it's not a spoiler you know that's uh how would it put it something that a, a young girl would design you know in the book <laughs> and he's just like this feels wrong man you know doing that i just thought that was a lot of fun oh, i'm glad you appreciate that yeah i mean i just you know, for any cool thing, there's always somebody who ruins it, and that's true in the book. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me think. What else was I going to... So we have also sort of his... We see his personal life with his brother, um, but then there's also this sort of uh, romantic subplot that I thought worked well. Uh, and one of the... Well, I don't know. Is it spoiling it? I don't know. Anyway... But also dogs are gone, as we said. And so some character in the book, I won't say who. So how their dragons have filled that void, but so have other animals. And he talks about, I just, I just thought that was not neat because you're, you're filling out this world in a way that you didn't maybe even have to. But, you know, he talks about seeing people with ferrets and with pigs. And um, it just added that layer of realism. I guess also you talk about Phoenix or is it Phoenix or Scott's? Where is it? Set? Arizona. And I wondered, aside from the, it would be a good place for dragons to live in the wild, why pick there? Where did that come from, maybe? Uh, well, I mean, sensibly speaking, Phoenix is also a biotech hub. Yeah. And so it's a place that a company might, like this might set up, but they have a wild hog problem there too. And so that's part of the, um, part of the motivation for that. I don't know. I mean, that's, not, that's a decision I made pretty early on. It just felt right. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to explore kind of the desert landscape a little bit, which was a lot of fun. So, and, and obviously I've been to Phoenix and had some chance to go out into the desert. So that's just a little bit of adventure for somebody who hasn't been there that I wanted to put in. You have uh, a character in the book. This is maybe he's talking about something that's not in the book, but I kind of thought its absence was interesting. And I wanted you to talk about maybe why you didn't want to explain, because we we pitched this and it was i think your uh line was build a bear workshop meets jurassic park we've talked about jurassic park actually already once here um and so we do have a little bit of the sort of you know because the theme of that to me is very much a frankenstein kind of theme we shouldn't be tampering in these things you know well you didn't you were worried about if you could you didn't stop to think if you should and i didn't notice that much in this book and i don't think it's I'm, this is not a criticism of the book i just wondered was that something you had felt like had been tackled already? Um, was it something, I don't know. I just, you know, we do have, I, the only reason I noticed it not being in there more is because one character does hint at it. And I just wanted to, just curious about that. You know, uh, if that was a theme that didn't particularly appeal to you or, or how that came to not play into the book. I guess. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that, while we definitely give a nod to Jurassic Park, we didn't want to be too much like that with yeah. this storyline. And, and so that's probably why I didn't delve into it more. I mean, I think there, there, is a, there are hints of that, like we talked about the point system and, and mm -hmm. how they were aware of um, the dangers of the capabilities that we have in, with new technologies. And that's something they, they think about and spend some time uh, discussing, arguing about, sometimes uh, pondering and questioning their life choices and their work choices. So that's, it's definitely a theme that is there kind of in the background. I didn't hit it too hard, like you said, because I think there are other stories that have done that pretty well. Um, there was, you know, when I first was working on this project, I, I played with the idea of our protagonist wanting to 
go rogue by trying to introduce dragons into the wild, which um, was kind of a cool concept. I mean, he would be positioned to do that, but uh, I also think somebody with a scientific background probably wouldn't do so casually either because we understand the importance of balanced ecosystems. And uh, so it was, it was just something I, you know, had fun with thinking about and then didn't ultimately go that way with the book, but it's certainly something that I spend time thinking about as do a lot of my colleagues because of the rapid pace of technology and the things that we right. can do with biological science, with genetics and genetic engineering and thinking about the consequences of those uh, and where they could be used where, to help the human experience or where they could be abused. And so these are questions that we as a society are going to have to grapple with probably in the near future, maybe yeah. sooner than a lot of us would prefer. Um, we have seen rapid advances in genome engineering technologies to the point where you can make somewhat precise changes to the genomes of living cells. And that technology has been applied to human embryos uh, kind of not necessarily with the endorsement of the scientific community, but by uh, researchers who decided to do so before it was illegal and or at least frowned upon. And so should we change the genome of someone we know who is fated to have a genetic disease? I mean, I think a lot of people might say, oh, yeah, I, I suppose we could do something like that. But then the next question is, okay, but could we also give them uh, blue eyes and blonde hair and, and that, and, uh, better muscles and you know other advantages and then it starts to get into murky material where mm -hmm. it's really hard to say what the right answer might be and probably a lot of people aren't going to agree on what the answer to those questions might be so i touch on it a little bit but i i'm leaving myself room to explore that a little bit later in more depth okay yeah that's what i was kind of asking if it was something how you decided to balance that it's interesting i just remembered i paged through it so i I'm going to sound like I really know what I'm talking about, but I think the a New Yorker just had an article about using genetic, um, I don't therapy, I guess, for invasive species. Cane to what? What if we, you know, use something to get rid of cane toads and what you know, uh, and. So I don't, it's very, and, I, and now I'm thinking about, we should just make dragons. That would solve our problem. Yeah, I, why not, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean. But yeah, as you're saying, this is something that's very, this is not far future. This is very, very near future stuff. Um, and, you know, especially when you're talking about something like an invasive species, well, that's something that humankind has already caused. So you can't just leave it. You have to, you know, anyway. <laughs> We're getting probably out of our depth here with <laughs> with this um, this conversation. Uh, what was oh so you said leave yourself room? Uh, I think does that mean then you are going to be returning to this world uh, in another book or you've written a short story which was up on Bain dot com a while back. People can maybe go look for that um, set in this world. But is there going to be another longer piece as well or? That, uh, yeah, that story is called One Way Dragon, and at least at the time we're recording this now, it's free to read on the Bain website. That um, gives you a little sense of the world of the book, but it, it, it's a quick read, and hopefully people will find it enjoyable. Um, I think that it's safe to say I definitely would like, I mean, I, this is a standalone book, and it, it, I always wrote it that way. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, when it was done and turned in and getting close to publication, I thought, I I could definitely see myself writing another book in that world. So that's something I'm kind of working on now that um, will feature some of the world and the people and the technology and kind of have a different spin on it. So that's something I'm working on. Great. Uh, let's talk about, I always like to talk about the cover. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, I think Dave Seeley was the cover? Yes, he was. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, did you have any input on that or did you did it put it hit the shelves? Is that what you found? When it hit your doorstep, the contributors copy, how did you, uh, I don't know, how did that, how did that strike you? I guess. <laughs> I saw, I saw it early. I mean, uh, I was lucky in that the good people at Bain asked me if I had ideas for the cover, which is the polite thing to ask an author, um, because ultimately it's up to the publisher. Right. But, uh, I had some, so they were like, hey, any good scenes from the book that you think might be good inspiration for the cover? And I came up with a few. Um, and I think they took that to Dave, who's the cover artist, who did a, a really excellent job. And so they 
they fix pretty early on a scene that's kind of um, early in the book where the protagonist sees one of their dragons for the first time. And as you can see, it's not necessarily a friendly uh, encounter. And um, I was just, uh, you know, when I saw even the early versions of that, I was so impressed by the, uh, both the artistic talent of the artist and, and how that scene is captured, but also like these fine little attentive details that are right from this, right from the book down to like one, one of the people was holding that. I was just so uh, astonished by, I really liked it. And even though I didn't necessarily suggest it, it uses this color scheme as like my favorite color. So I was, I'm sorry to say, I didn't have more input than saying, hey, this would be one of the good scenes you could make a cover from. And the artists and uh, the art department did the rest. So I'm just, I just got lucky. What can I say? Hey, that's great. Yeah. Well, um, we're, we're about good on time, but was there anything else that you wanted to touch on? Um, you know, the balance on all these interviews is you don't want to give too much away. Uh, so I've tried to stay out of the last half of the book. Oh, the no, I think we've done a pretty good job of that because a lot happened, so we haven't yeah. discussed. Well, is there anything you wanted to hit on uh, before we before we call it? Um, or do we want to just leave people wanting more and they can go out? Oh, no. Well, I mean, I think we should end with um, my apology to dog lovers because definitely <laughs> some of them have been displeased with my choices in uh, in deciding to eliminate the book. And they're like, why not cats? And, yeah. and uh, why couldn't you have gotten rid of cats? And I, I have two answers to that first. Um, cats don't play nearly as many roles in our society as dogs do. Um, they are pets, of course, but they're not many services that cats provide for us quite the opposite actually <laughs> and um the other thing is that i'm just i'm more afraid of cat people than i am of dog people so yeah. <laughs> i mean i own a dog, now. Take dog off the cat people. so <laughs> that's just that's my justification i do apologize and um certainly in this world i think we haven't seen the end of dogs so i hope i'll eventually be forgiven for this yeah maybe you know maybe you can be a like a a profit of we can create dragons but hopefully not the, the end of dogs which by the way has a very logical um explanation in the book i thought you know everything in the book it's like it should feel outlandish because you're creating dragons but it felt so grounded and hard science fictional um i thought it was well i appreciate great. that i mean that one i didn't even see coming i mean who would have thought that uh, a pandemic that affects the entire globe and eliminates a lot of a population wouldn't be science fiction by the time the right. book came out right but uh i wrote that uh before 2019 so i don't think uh i was even thinking that something like that could happen yeah. to humans but uh, it certainly could happen to any animal species and we have yeah. seen it happen to some other animals where we've lost most of the species. So it's something that uh, unfortunately has a uh, grounding in reality. Yeah, much as we wish it weren't the case, yeah. Um, well, the book is out now in, uh, I usually have it, but I read it on my my Kindle, should I say that? It's right over my, your shoulder. My e Yeah, it's right here, my e-reading device, which you can uh, get the book at Bain eBooks, of course, DRM free or wherever you get your eBooks. And it's also out in trade paperback right now. Yes uh it is on the shelf or in the warehouse wherever you want to order it from so or get it from so uh, dan thanks so much for coming on to the bain free radio hour is great talking with you and hopefully we'll have you back on to talk about uh you know whatever the sequel is or whatever your next <laughs> bain. well thank you very much for having me this was a lot of fun uh, i hope people will check out the book and i think we should definitely have more conversations in the future this was enjoyable well, thank you so much. And now we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Solarian League. For hundreds of years, they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising courage. Honor Harrington has worn the star kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now, the mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. 
uncompromising vengeance. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Solarian League, and hell is riding in her wake. SLNS Quebec. Task Force 790, Beowulf System. Damage evaluation? Vincent Capriotti demanded harshly. Impossible to say, sir, Angelica Helland answered for Liang Tao Rutgers. The ops officer was far too busy as Quebec shuddered to the sawtooth vibration of launching countermissiles. We won't know till we hear from the light speed platforms and... She flipped her head at the tactical plot and the missile icons ripping through TF-790's outer defensive zone. Their covering EW systems were incredible, better even than Capriotti's staff had projected from the Hypatia reports. 5,000 missiles had launched against TF-790. 500 were pure EW and Pennade platforms, and another 550 were Mark 23E control missiles with no warhead of any sort. Of the 3,950 actual attack birds, 3,107 broke past the CMs and hurtled into the teeth of the last ditch laser clusters at a closing velocity of well over 81% of light speed. The laser clusters took down 1,206 more of them. There was no way for Helen or Capriotti to know it, but their defense's performance was by far the best any Solarian force had yet achieved against an allied missile attack. It just wasn't good enough. 1,900 Mark 23s broke through everything TF-790 had. Pinpoint precision couldn't be expected at that velocity, especially with no telemetry updates in the last 11 minutes of their flight. But unlike anyone else's missiles, the Mark 23E control missile had been specifically designed to operate well beyond telemetry range, even FTL telemetry range of any mothership. The Mark 23s were far more capable even than the SLN's new Astas, and each Mark 23E in that salvo had formed a separate data sharing node, communicating all across the salvo, sharing the sensor data from its missile sensors with all of the others, and integrating all of that data into a coherent picture of the battlefield, which more myopic missiles operating in isolation could never have matched. The consequences were cataclysmic. That was another entry in David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkiewicz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Dan Cobalt for coming on and talking about his new novel, Domesticating Dragons. And thanks as always to Tony Daniel for having me sit in this week. You know, I had a great time, but honestly, Tony's reason for wanting me here, it, it kind of seemed a little silly. I guess he bought some sort of golden glove thingy off eBay. He called it a gauntlet, and it was missing one of the six stones it was supposed to have. And he seemed to think it was really important that he go track that down. I don't know. It seemed a little flashy for his style to me, but whatever. He'll probably tell us all about it next week. Until then, I've been David Afsharirod, coming to you live from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars.